It's Behind the Bastards, a podcast that is opened in a radically different way pretty much every week, but usually one that involves me making sounds with my mouth. I don't make... understand how you're this successful of a podcast. <laughs> no, I, I <laughs> <get it. laughs> no one does, Garrison. <laughs> Nobody does. But they can't they can't stop it. They can't uh, they can't stop the signal. You know, I'm like I'm like the Rolling Stones of Please podcasting. Stop talking. The Andrew Tate of podcasting. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Margaret. Thank yes, you for that. That's what everyone's that, saying. For, for that unalloyed compliment. <laughs> so horrible. We have we have we started this episode by talking about Adam Weishaupt and the Bavarian Illuminati, um, which started out as a, a nerdy kid kind of trying to find a way to smuggle cool books into Bavaria that were banned. Um, and in doing so, he created a fake religion so that rich people would feel like wizards uh, and he could use their money to buy more books. And it ended up with him funding illegal abortions uh, until a lightning strike exposed his society to the cops. And then he had to flee and spend the rest of his life having the equivalent of an extended Twitter argument. Um, this this sounds books. so fake. This sounds it's like so such funny. a fake story. <laughs> it is. It's both sad and funny. And I, I've continued my reading on this. Um, one of the troubles here is that like, there's a, an actual paucity of good historical books about the Illuminati who are not written by cranks. Right. Um, I, I picked the one of the Charles river editors are not usually my ideal source, but they do a decent job of like summarizing all of the the, the actual facts that are known. Um, I found another book that I have been reading through that is one of the crank books. It's called The Illuminati, The Secret Society That Hijacked the World by Jim Mars um, uh-huh. with, with, with two R's. And Mars is is absolutely a crank uh, that for, for an idea of what a crank he is, his book on secrets uh, or in the chapters on the Illuminati. Part one is Germany and part two is Zionism. So oh, oh you, no. know, you know oh, we're going boy. some good directions in this book. That's going to bridge what we're going to have <laughs> yeah. to talk about today, isn't it? <laughs> um, I want to read. There's some wild quotes in here. Um, and most of them will not be most relevant until we get later on in here. But I want to read a portion of uh, something that I, I cannot speak entirely on the veracity of. Um, but th- this is a chunk of his book when he's talking about the formation of the Illuminati. In 1779, two years after Weishaupt's initiation into Freemasonry, he w- wrote to Zwackenhurdle suggesting the order be renamed the Society of Bees. The bee connection again demonstrates the close ties to the Illuminati of the Illuminati to Masonry, as the beehive has long been an important Freemason symbol. Today's Masonic lodges were once referred to as hives, and any internal disputes are called swarming. One 18th century Masonic ritual stated, the beehive teaches us that as we are born into the world rational and intelligent beings, so what we also be industrious ones and not stand idly by or gaze with listless indifference on even the meanest of our fellows in a state of distress if it is in our power to help them without detriment to ourselves or our connections. The symbol of bees also connects to the aforementioned ancient Greek Eleusinian mysteries in which honey was thought to be a divine product of the gods. So that's kind of cool. Now, that's some wisher actually, man pa- shit. Yeah, I am. I, I am. I'm all for uh, beehive. I, I like the dis- I like the discussion yeah. of arguments within Masonic temples as swarming. Yes. Um, yeah, <laughs> it, it's it's all so much of this story is extremely Twitter, like almost bad. Yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> It's nice to know that radicals have always been more or less the same kind of people. Um, nice isn't the word I would use. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's Re- reassuring. I don't. <laughs> it's a thing that's that's undeniable. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah uh, so that's good stuff. So um, we should probably get back into the story. When we had left off, we had just been talking about how um, the conspiracy theory about the Illuminati. Uh, started up after the French Revolution and kind of merged with existing fears about masonry in the United States to be part of this big anti-Masonic movement. You've got guys like Abigail Adams and even uh, George Washington himself who bought into this conspiracy. And this would be this would be like one of the funny things about Jim Mar- or about, uh, I don't know, whatever Mars's book is that like when he talks about American connections to the Illuminati, he just says that, like, we know that, you know, no, m- multiple members of the founding fathers were aware of the Illuminati. And it's like, yeah, they believe the same shit you did. Like, they all had bought yeah. the same conspiracy, buddy. <laughs> um, 
So far, the it's bastards a, is the people who believe in the Illuminati, not the Illuminati. No, the Illuminati are not bastards. Although, again, perhaps if you create a fake cult in order to do a good thing, you might wind up causing more problems than you solve. Um, That's that may true. Be, that may be a lesson from the Illuminati that we can take into us today. That's true. Um, you know what, Sophie? Let the initiates out of the cage. Uh, I think maybe we've been we've been going down the wrong, the wrong, uh, the wrong road. Uh, you couldn't uh, even get that sentence out. Yeah, I would <laughs> never tell. I would, I, I would never tell you to let the initiates out of the cage. That's where they live now. So Jesus over time, Christ. over time, the Illuminati conspiracy theory died out. Would be the wrong word, but it it kind of faded. Um, but America's public obsession with conspiracy theories never quite did. And politicians learned over the decades that stoking these conspiracies was an easy way to get. Boats. After the uh-huh. Masons, popular American conspiracy culture pivoted to obsess over the Jesuits and then the communists, <laughs> which, despite the fact that they are kind of diametrically opposed in fundamental ways, often got looped in together as like a Jesuit communist conspiracy. That was a whole yeah. big thing in the early half of the 20th century. Um, and of course, every time you would have sort of a new era in American conspiracy culture, the trappings of prior manias would roll forward into each new conspiracy that enraptured the voting public it's you know it's syncretism this is a thing that um uh, umberto echo talks about when he talks about like one of the key attributes of fascism and i think it is kind of worth noting and a little bit beyond the scope of this episodes but to talk about how american conspiracy culture has always been proto-fascist in many ways and yeah. this is this is the syncretism of it and we've, we've really seen this come to roost with donald trump and QAnon, and sort of this is why you get a lot of liberals who are very surprised when they see these kind of People who had been sort of formerly crunchy granola hippie types yeah. get into the hardcore right wing QAnon stuff, and it's like that's syncretism, baby. That's exactly what Echo was talking about. No, this 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 also ties into like the idea of like uh, the cultic milieu mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. how the uh, the shared Absolutely. space where all these types of conspiracy conspiracies operate feed off each other and and do and do kind of coalesce into this weird like a uh, crypto or a uh, quasi fascist yeah. politic. Yeah, and if you if you want to if you want to look at this as like I don't know if you wanted to like diagram this as like a a soil or something like that or, or sedimentary layers, the base of it all is the Illuminati, right? That is the Ur conspiracy in American political culture. Um, so yeah. Uh, meanwhile, the end of the 1800s and the start of the 1900s saw another surge of interest in the occult. It seems like this kind of happens once every century or so. Um, that's been pretty consistent for like the <laughs> yeah. last 300 years, something like yeah. that. Uh, and over in Europe, a pair of wizards resurrected the Illuminati. The founders were tied to the OTO and Aleister Crowley, and the second Illuminati was never really much more than a sideshow. Um, it's, it's primary contribution to kind of occult history in Europe was that in 1902, it allied itself with the order of the golden dawn. Now the golden dawn had also been founded on, shall we say shaky, his shaky grounds, truth wise yes. by a Rosicrucian named Wentworth little, who claimed to have come into the possession of a coded manuscript that led him to a woman named Anna Sprengel in Germany, who was in touch with unknown superiors. Uh, who had taught him about a secret organization behind the the secret organization behind the you know myth of the Rosicrucians, um, and you can see shades of kind of what uh, Weishaupt was doing with the Illuminati here. I've I, you know this organization has a history that's actually much older than people know. There's this group of of unknown folks in addition to me who are actually running things. Um, yeah, uh, I want to quote here from our our old friend pro cult activist Massimo Introvine again. <laughs> Because <laughs> he's, he's, again, if you're going to write a detailed history of this shit, you're going to wind up quoting a lot of cranks and weirdos. It's mostly <laughs> going to be cranks and weirdos. That's This is just a fact of the matter. Westcott claimed to have found Sprangle's address, to have written to her, and to have obtained the authorization of the unknown superiors to found an order in England placed under their authority, the Golden Dawn. In spite of the great influence it exerted on art and literature, the Golden Dawn rested on a mystification. There was no Anna Sprangle, and Westcott had simply invented the whole story. It was Aleister Crowley who had been initiated into the Golden Dawn in 1898 and had immediately engaged in trying to overthrow its leaders, who in 1900 (laughs) revealed the deception. (laughs) <laughs> Crowley, Crowley's a very complicated figure, he sure is yes. um, and he I think in a lot of ways qualifies a, as a bastard 
Um, yeah. But one of the cool things that he did was completely overthrow every magical community <laughs> that he that that he yeah. went into. If and you it's let like, this guy it's, it's into a, your wizard club, he's going to take over. <laughs> he will take over your wizard club. Guaranteed. You cannot stop him. <laughs> and make you admit that you made the whole thing up. It's yes, in, and and then have a lot of gay sex in the yeah, desert. So I, you know, I, I, okay. I, I am certainly the least knowledge about knowledgeable about Crowley in our organization. But my the thing that I always took from readings about him is that he was able to do that in all these organizations because he had he's got some jock energy to him. Yes, that like most <laughs> wizards don't have. <laughs> so he's, he just kind of had that confidence that let him bully his way in. <laughs> it's just kind of like when punks go to like nerd conventions, we're just in charge because yes. we actually yeah. have social skills and we like, yeah. Oh, this is gonna, this is gonna be very controversial on the subreddit. <laughs> Margaret Killjoy just got canceled. <laughs> yeah, uh, I can finally rest. Crow- Crowley was really the first punk is yeah. what you're trying to say. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He, yeah, he I'm going to the... take a stand and say that yeah. I absolutely no, I actually don't know that much. Somewhere about underground in the vault vault of the Golden Dawn is the very first battle jacket. <laughs> <laughs> I'm into it. Yeah. But um, also, but you keep talking about this thing where it's like it it seems like the cultists are the okay ones and the conspiracy theorists are the ones who do the Nazi shit. Yeah, I mean, because yes. these these guys, the people forming this new order of, I mean, the people who kind of form this new f- Illuminati and marry it to the Golden Dawn, I haven't come across any evidence that they're bastards. Like, they were, yeah. they were people who wanted to dress up and do magic. Like, there's nothing yeah. harmful about what they're doing here. <laughs> um, it just, it, it's not wildly influential. Uh, Engel, who is one of the people who winds up in charge of this new Illuminati, funds it, I found this interesting, by writing a series of, like, short stories for dime novels under a shitload of different names. Um, He he kind of does an L. Ron Hubbard, but in reverse, where, like, Hubbard writes all these dime novels and then creates a cult because he wants to get out of that industry, whereas (laughs) Engel funds his little cult by writing a bunch of, like, shitty weird fiction. I don't know if it was shitty, actually. I haven't read it. I shouldn't be judgmental like that. It might have been good weird fiction. (laughs) <laughs> um, his Illuminati limps on into the 1970s when they fa- fall afoul of Germany's militant post-war anti-cult movement. There is, we talk about this in the episodes. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> That's just really funny. <laughs> yeah. Well, we talk about this in the episodes titled The School That, that Raped Everyone, um, uh, which is a dark episode about how there was an element of kind of the progressive left in post-war Germany that embraced free love politics to such an extent that they started justifying the molestation of children. Um, And this is a big part of what gets the Illuminati in trouble. I have not found any evidence that they are molesting anybody, but they are Mm -hmm. teaching sex magic. And because there are a lot of problems with other kind of people in who are broadly in the same sort of cultic milieu, you might say, as the Illuminati in this period, who are molesting children, they get caught up in, I don't even want to call it a moral panic, a lot of people were actually harmed, but the Illuminati does not seem to have been justifiably targeted here. They were just like adults who were doing satanic orgies, which is fine. Yeah, I mean, like, but like this, this complaint continues on today, how a lot of, yes, a lot of like sex cults are specifically the OTO is... Mm -hmm just kind of a sex cult for its yeah. for, for its like older male members this yeah. is this is this this is something that is uh is yeah very very much a continuing critique and there's nothing inherently wrong with making a sex cult for you and your friends i've been in a couple of sex cults it's fine um yeah they yeah. always end great is what ever it's what everyone <laughs> says about sex cults some of them do um <laughs> yeah and and the illuminati doesn't end all that terribly but it, it just kind of peters out after okay. this point uh the last leader of the second illuminati a guy named metzger dies a lonely alcoholic in 1990 which is a pretty common way for things to end for the leaders of sex cults yeah. Um, while Metzger's Illuminati was limping through the last arthritic stages of its life, events over in the United States were about to bring the Illuminati to a level of fame it hadn't enjoyed even in the days of Adam. I shopped. <sighs> Carrie Wendell Thornley was born on April 17th, 1938 in Whittier, California. Whittier is today a suburb of Los Angeles. Um, it is back then it was kind of just like its own little town in the middle of 
you know, Southern California. If you Google the neighborhood that Carrie Thornley grew up in today, you'll immediately be shown a map that depicts the unincorporated community boxed in by bold blue pins that indicate a Costco, a Home Depot, a Savers, a Target, and a Trader Joe's. They surround East Whittier like a capitalist pentagram, almost as if hermetic <laughs> capitalist wizards were trying to keep some sort of dangerous energy contained within. These are the things you think about when you uh-huh. spend 16 hours writing about the Illuminati late at night. <laughs> <laughs> no one um, fuck up those stores or all yeah. hell will be loosed upon the world yeah these demons are the- will crawl from underneath the Costco and start taking over the suburbs these are the seven seals of neoliberalism yeah. <laughs> this is a John Darnell novel and I would read it uh, Carrie was raised Mormon and for much of the first seven years of his life his father was overseas fighting in a little thing you might have heard of called the Second World War. Most of the context we have for his childhood comes from a letter his brother wrote decades later that I found reprinted in a zine published by Carrie's ideological children. Most of the good history on Carrie you find scattered in zines that are like 30 years old. So That's it great. is a whole thing piecing yeah. it together. Uh, I'm going to read a quote from that letter now, though. And this is his brother talking. We were living behind my grandparents when I was born in what is now called Watts on 77th Street in L.A., and our dad was in the Navy stationed in Okinawa at the time. When dad had returned from World War II, Carrie was waiting to welcome him dressed in a sailor's outfit my mom had gotten him, and I was a newborn in a cradle. Dad came in the door and rushed over to see me before he hugged Carrie. Carrie got so pissed that he ran out the back door and climbed up the walnut tree and refused to come down. That event, more than any other, set the tone for Carrie's relationship with me. The rest of my life is punctuated with events in which Carrie did his best to get even with me from what I called his intellectual muggings, when I was in college to writing parodies of letters that I would send him later in life. Our father was a, li- was a raging alcoholic, so, by necessity, Carrie became like a father figure to me and Dick. So he's like a complicated guy. He's he's The fact that his dad is absent, I think, has a big impact on him, and he he feels this sense of like jealousy for his father's attention because it had been so absent, but also because his father is this violent asshole. He sort of acts to protect his younger brothers. You know, it's a complicated Mm -hmm. thing. I think he does, you know, he's obviously he's a kid. So there's sometimes he does shit out of spite to his brothers, but you get the feeling that he did the most that he could to try and fill that gap that was left by his dad being a non-functional person. Um, like he did the best job I think you could have expected of a kid in that circumstance. It's a difficult way to grow up. Yeah. Um, Carrie met Greg Hill, who was three years younger in high school in 1956. The two were members of the very first generation of they're nerds. They're big fucking nerds. Uh, and they were sometimes mocked by it. Think like George McFly from Back to the Future. That is exactly the kind of kids that we're talking about. They were huge into Mad Magazine, uh, which was kind (laughs) of like... That was a lot of people who wind up very radical in the 60s and 70s start yeah. by reading Mad Magazine in, yeah. in, in, you know, in the early 60s or whatever. Um, and they were interested in radical political ideas, much like the ones that had animated Adam Weishaupt centuries before. They were also, again, big sci-fi nerds with what one biographer describes as a fondness for crackpots. Their ch- childhoods would have involved colorful, weirdly horny comic books and the short stories of men like Bob Heinlein, Philip K. Dick, and L. Ron Hubbard. Greg and Carrie were so excited by this stuff that they briefly attended meetings of a nearby U- UFO cult as adolescents called Understanding. Greg later recalled, Through our mutual general interest in wondering just what was going on out there in the, that gigantic world, and our many common specific interests in humanism, anti-religionism, an enjoyment for uh, enjoyment for Omar Khayyam, and a curiosity for the bizarre like black magic and hypnotism, plus our common warped sense of humor, we formed a close friendship. So that's that's who these guys are, right? Like they're they're kind of young kids in this boring town and they get really into science fiction and fantasy and that leads them into reading about the occult and reading all of these also kind of like mystic they're into the Sufis, they're into Zen Buddhism. Like they're yeah. not just into like they're kind cool. of um golden dawns. Yeah, they're they're pretty cool actually. Yeah, um, I I would say. So I don't know how this that, is going to end up. So, but I'm going to hold on to them as being real cool right now. 
it, they they're it's going to end in a couple of different ways, Margaret. <laughs> okay. Everyone involved in the movement we're talking about has a very very different ending. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Like a choose your own adventure novel. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um I do want to talk a little bit about Omar Khayyam, um who is a he he was a a guy who lived from like basically around 1000-ish to 1100 AD. Um, he's a polymath, one of these guys who's like, he's doing math and he's a philosopher and he's writing poetry that's still very popular today. Um, and he's it, one of the things about him that's kind of interesting and that's probably going to be relevant, that's going to definitely be relevant to the way that Kerry Thornley uses him because Thornley's obsessed with this guy is that for kind of centuries and centuries after his death, it became a tradition in a chunk of at least Islamic poetry to attribute your poems to Omar Khayyam. Um, and huh. this started being done, this like, for whatever reason in the 1800s, uh, uh, Europeans start doing this too. And this, some of this is tied in with like uh, Orientalism. I'm not a great mm -hmm. person to discuss that because this is a very influential figure. But one thing that's important to know is he is a real poet who also has become kind of this I don't know if it's calling him a symbol is the right thing, but people decided to attribute poems to him that had not been been written by him. There's a bunch of these throughout history, these like shared yes, yes. author names. They're really interesting to me. Yeah, it is. It is really interesting. Obviously, Kerry Thornley is very interested in this guy, maybe in part because of that. A lot of a lot of like occult authors also also have this. There's like Hermes Trismegistus. There's there's a lot of um, even um even uh the uh, uh oh I forget the. I forget the name. Let me look it up quick. Um, well, that's why I have a new book coming out by um, uh, Al Alistair Crowley. Um, is the name I write <laughs> under now. See, uh, Margaret, <laughs> I'm doing a totally different thing. I'm just going to credit my next book to Stephen King and just take that money. You know, yeah. just, just, <laughs> yeah. just just take that cash, baby. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> so, in, in terms of occult authors who also did this, there was um, uh, the the uh, fourth book of occult philosophy by uh, Agrippa. Probably not written by, no, by the actual Agrippa um, who had been dead for several thousand years. Yeah, it's 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 it's, it's, it's just <laughs> yeah, it's it's well, an interesting the, uh, trend that that continues because like the types of communities that were re that were writing these uh, occult texts as groups really do get continued by the stuff that Greg Hill was actually inadvertently developing, and it's interesting yeah. like just how similar this type of stuff is. Okay, and yeah, then one I, of I, the I, other of these shared names, Luther Blissett is a, I haven't heard of that one. Italian collective of radicals who then uh, lots of people write under this name that put out a book called Q that's a conspiracy book that yes! came out before oh, any of this before the QAnon and <laughs> I believe and I might have I don't have the notes in front of me but Luther Blissett is like some like famous like soccer player and these like Italian radicals were just like we're just going to use his name and the dude was like alive and that's they were like very funny. and they wrote this like bestseller called Q that's a conspiracy novel. Shit's weird. That is very funny. And uh, you know what else is funny, Margaret? Um, the, the stuff. The, adder, the products and services, the ads supporting this podcast, all of which, uh, by the way, all of our ads are, are written and produced by, by Omar Khayyam. So, you know, enjoy some of this classic Seljuk capitalism poetry. It's just going to be some math ads. I hope it's gold. I bet he had gold. Might have. Everyone did back then, yeah. We're back. So, Carrie Thornley and Greg Hill and, and a circle of their friends. And I am leaving. There's a lot of actual people here who, who you can read about who are also influential. I'm not going to go into detail about all of them. There's a reason I'm going to focus primarily on, on Thornley and Hill here. Um, I'll, I'll be suggesting a book later if you want to learn more about every single person who was involved in this this next stage of the Illuminati. Um, but yeah, they, the, the, the core of this circle seems to be Thornley and Hill, and they are some. There's something kind of magnetic about the two when they are together. Part of it has to do with the fact that Kerry is an undeniably talented public speaker, and he seems to have kind of a um, an ability to lead people, or at least be so obsessed with something in it, such an endearing way that people feel the desire to follow him. Um, one of the things that he, Kerry and Greg both were really into was playing pranks on their cl classmates. Uh, and I'm going to read a segment from a biography by a guy named Adam Go Rightly um, that talks about one of the pranks that they played on their school chums. 
Kerry, Greg, and other unnamed cohorts made a recording of what at first appeared to be a regular radio program, with music playing innocently from a radio positioned on the apron of the stage. In in actuality, the sounds were projected from a reel-to-reel tape machine hidden backstage. Inserted into the seemingly mundane radio program, the pranksters had implanted a series of interruptions made by a newscaster to the effect that Soviet planes were invading the U.S. and dropping bombs. As one classmate recalled, somebody had told me early on that it was a joke, but some of the students didn't know and got really scared. What made me feel bad was that one of the boys in the class was so scared he was praying. <laughs> so this is like I I kind of know where this story goes. Uh, yes. From, from 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 this point on. Yeah. And the fact that they were doing this shit as kids mm-hmm. is hilarious. Because it's extremely this, funny. This this exact same style of mm-hmm. prank and the kind yeah. of recklessness that they go about it gets continued on to massive yeah. proportions. Like they do so much inadvertent damage by pranks of this style. Yeah. Yep. on a national scale very soon <laughs> and it's so weird to just you're just like you're like just watching the train about about to crash and you're just, mm-hmm. you're seeing it go and you know what's gonna happen <laughs> and it, it kind of in line with that garrison carrie's friends at the time when interviewed later would note that as a kid he had a habit of excess he did not seem to know how to stop himself when the playing around got out of hand yeah um that said he was also intensely empathetic and one of the stories told about him is that after his high school graduation one of his close friends came out of the closet to him as gay this is in 1957 um and that friend when interviewed was like yeah he just like embraced me like there was never any judgment he was completely completely accepting and fine um which is noteworthy some some of these people are like actually really decent people and like uh, and and have had and and have like pretty good politics Mm -hmm. and we're doing kind of rad stuff in the 1950s and 60s yeah well some of yeah and and w- 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 let's let's put a pin in that one Garrison. yeah uh-huh. um thornley graduated high school in 1957 uh he attended marine corps reserve boot camp that summer this is not a thing he had a choice in like a lot of people would just kind of join ahead of getting drafted in order to have some amount of like choice in where they went i had a lot of relatives who were like well if i join then i get to like pick kind of what i'm i have more agency in this process yeah uh so he goes to boot camp and then he gets into the university of southern california um he spent a lot of time still at home with his friends many of whom namely greg hadn't yet graduated they spent the bulk of their free time at 24-hour bowling alleys where they could buy alcohol one night in 1957 yeah. yeah and he's buying alcohol greg is a couple of years younger than carrie so greg is or carrie is often the one buying alcohol for his underage friends Basically. um which we always support here at cool zone media I definitely um, didn't make my living doing that <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when i was a 21 year old street mm-hmm. punk no way <laughs> <laughs> you would never do something like that when it was it's the only way to make money uh-uh. <laughs> one night in 1957 hill and thornley were discussing poems carrie had written on order emerging from chaos hill argued that order was a construction of the human mind only chaos was real now fuck yeah there's a couple of versions of what comes next in the version that mirrors objective reality hill an atheist expressed his frustration with modern organized religions for claiming the existence of an organizing principle behind the universe the ancient greeks he expressed had gotten it closest to right because they had a goddess of chaos her name was eris or discordia in latin Hill felt that Eris was the only deity he'd ever seen any evidence of, and he suggested it might be a good idea if someone created a religion based around her. (laughs) It's going to go great. (laughs) It's going to go really (laughs) well. It's going to go so good, Margaret. It's it's fine. I'm so excited. (laughs) Now, while he was at college, Thornley attempted to join a fraternity, Delta Sigma Phi. In what would be one of his only real brushes with the square world, he pledged and he went through a hazing ritual called Hell Week. That year, the brothers allowed a black student to pledge. They made him go through Hell Week, and then after he had gone through all of that kind of hazing shit, they laughed at him and told him that, of course, as a black guy, he was not allowed to join their fraternity. This was enough to get Kerry to leave and to turn him away from the concept of fraternities forever. If he ever made a secret society, it was going to be one defined by radical acceptance. Hill and Thornley kept up their correspondence on the subject of creating some sort of, like, 
you know, they're, they're talking about doing the same kind of shit that Vi Shop is doing. They're just, yeah. they did. Mm-hmm. They're just talking about doing it from a, a, a perspective of like, this would be kind of a funny thing. Um, and they it's kind just, of chat about it. It's just it. a prank, bro. It's just a prank. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a prank. Fun. It's fine. It's, 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 it's casually. And it, it is mixed with things they seriously believe. You know, Hill is, yeah. you might call Hill a very early atheist activist, right? You know, pre Dawkins, pre all of that, you know, that kind of guys who became really prominent in the late 90s, early 2000s. Hill is that in the late 1950s, early 60s. Mm-hmm. But Whereas, also, he's he's like much less insufferable than the guys no, that yeah, follow. Yeah, I, I don't because, think he is. Because he understands understands yeah. like the chaotic nature of existence yeah yeah and, and thornley i think is, is is simpatico with hill on a lot but thornley is a little more mystical right like okay. I, I, yeah uh, it, it, he seems to be kind of more moved by that stuff although not to an agree that a degree that it seems to like great on hill who is kind of fundamentally a materialist value uh, or, or vision of the universe that's at least my take on this there's so many much that also that's very contradictory about these guys so if you do your own research on this you may come to some different conclusions about some of the uh, this than i am it really depends on which zines you stumble into <laughs> <laughs> um, and like a lot of these guys who were writing stuff about themselves yeah. wrote it contradictory on purpose to make things confusing mm-hmm. because yes. they, cause they thought it was a funny prank because they thought it was a funny prank this so, is all of French philosophy I really uh, yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> Thornley winds up joining the Marine Corps. Um, you know, he after he does his like a little bit of time in college, he becomes active duty in the Corps, um, and so he spends a couple of years as a Marine. And while he is a Marine stateside, he spends I think it's a little less than a year serving alongside a bright young man that you might have know heard of named Lee Harvey Oswald. Uh, and Carrie and Lee Harvey Oswald become pretty good friends. <laughs> they are, they are, they are buddies. And one of the things that Carrie likes about Oswald is that he's a little bit of a prankster, yeah, <laughs> just a, a, funny just prank a jokester, to to. just yeah. a just a kooky guy. That's what everybody knows about Lee Harvey Oswald. He's going to tell a very famous joke in the not too distant future from this point. <laughs> Gets him a lot of attention. It's a lot like you. <laughs> hit, hit tweet. Hit tweet. There yeah. we go. Gonna, I'm going to read another quote. the projectors under this one. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to read another quote from Adam Go Rightly's book. Quote. Later, Carrie would describe Oswald as the outfit eight ball, earning this dubious distinction by openly subscribing to communist newspapers such as Pravda and cracking jokes with an exaggerated Russian accent, answering questions with da or niet, and referring to his fellow Marines as comrades. It was common knowledge that Oswald was studying Russian and was fairly fluent in conversational Russian. Because of this, he inquired the nickname Oswaldskovich. <laughs> And this is <laughs> no one. No one's reporting this. You're in a war against Russia. And no, the no. Guys, like I'm a communist. See, this is actually. I wanted to talk about this. This is a thing. I think a lot of folks who, because of the fact that they are more on the left side of things mm. and maybe don't have a lot of firsthand experience with the military, don't get so much because there's like there's like a conspiracy theory going around right now, right? That it has been going on for a while, but because it was Pat Tillman got brought up at the Super Bowl by those fucks at the NFL. This was was talked about uh, recently where folks are like, oh, he was obviously murdered by his own guys because they heard him talking about how the war was bullshit and like saying like anti-American stuff. And so they they assassinated him. This is a conspiracy theory. That's not Mm -hmm. what happened. Um, It's incredibly common if you talk to guys who were serving in combat in Afghanistan and Iraq for people to say, this war is bullshit. What we're doing is stupid. Um, I have talked to people who'd be like, yeah, half the unit thought that what we were doing over there was bullshit. It was not uncommon for people to be like, fuck this stupid war. Yeah. It's like a thing that like, like soldiers fuck around and soldiers like anyone else often while they are participating in whatever war at, express opinions that are contra to yeah. Fair the enough. the like and and Oswald is one of these guys and so he does get in trouble a couple of times but like he's never drummed out of the Marines for making for doing jokes about being a communist yeah um and they're not also entirely jokes and in fact Oswald is for at least a period of his military service seen as a pretty good soldier 
In a later part of his life, Carey and another one of their comrades would claim that he, Oswald, and this other Marine were approached by someone that they believe was a representative of the CIA and given aptitude tests. Oswald and this other Marine were asked if they would be interested in parachuting into foreign countries and helping radio uh, rebels do things like build radios. This is School of America shit, and there were absolutely U.S. soldiers who had this experience. I can't confirm or deny whether or not that happened to Oswald in specific, uh, but this is a thing that occurred, right? Like, so it's not okay. unlikely that some version of this happened. Yeah, I mean, Carrie, in, by all accounts, he seems to be like decent at being a soldier. And he, was a pretty, a, he was a pretty good shot. A, a pretty good shot. <laughs> so, so yeah. Robert, you're saying on the record that the CIA hired him to assassinate John F. Kennedy? That is that is exactly what I'm saying, Margaret. Okay. Um, and actually, Margaret, hold up, because it gets a lot more conspiratorial here. Oh, okay. So, Carrie would also later, and this is in a point of his life when his mental health is not so great, he would also later claim that he was targeted by the MK Ultra program during this part of his life. <laughs> now, here's the thing. After his time with Oswald, he was stationed at Atsugi Air Base in Japan as a radar technician. And it is while he was stationed here that he starts having auditory hallucinations at night of radio chatter in his head. Kerry became convinced that he was hearing actual radio traffic in his head. This is at a later portion of his life. Now, Atsugi Air Base is host to a major was host to a major CIA base, and mm -hmm. it was one of two foreign bases where the CIA conducted MK Ultra experiments. In a Rolling Stone investigation okay. published years later, an anonymous Marine who served at Atsugi around the same time as Kerry did, and Oswald at a separate period of time serves at Atsugi Air Base. This guy claims it was pretty weird. I'm 18 at the time and chasing all the whores in town, and these CIA guys are buying me drinks and paying for the whores. And and giving me a whole round of drinks with lots of weird drugs in them. Pretty soon, all the shadows are moving around. We're in the bar. See, the samurais are everywhere. And I started seeing skeletons and things. My mind just started <laughs> boiling over, going about a thousand miles a minute. Now, there's a distinctly higher than zero chance that either Oswald or Thornley, or quite possibly both of them, were dosed as part of the MK Ultra experiments. Yeah. And if doing so, by the way, this is not like trying to say some conspiracy about the Kennedy assassination here. They would, if that happened to them, they are just some of hundreds and hundreds of U.S. servicemen who were dosed by the CIA against their will. Yeah. This happened constantly to tens of thousands of people, as we've talked about in our, our MK Ultra episodes. We will never know for certain because the architect of MK Ultra burned all of the files. So just keep it in your mind. It is possible that the first time Carrie Thornley has LSD, it's because the CIA drugs him, which convinces him that he's hearing voices at night. Um, we will never know. Um, it's also there's stories from Oswald around this period that like one night he starts freaking out that there's guys shooting at him from like the woods when he's on guard duty that some people have theorized like, oh, yeah, maybe he just got fucking dosed uh, and yeah. had a, a breakdown. Um, this happens to a lot of guys. It's certainly not impossible that it happened to Oswald and Thornley. As someone who's been now, dosed against my will before this all tracks. Yeah, because when you um, don't know this... that you're on drugs, it's a completely different experience than when you know you're on drugs. Yeah, that is in, entirely possible. Um, and I think it, I think there's actually a pretty good chance at least one of them did because they're both at Itsugi and we know the CIA is doing this shit to servicemen at Itsugi. Yeah. Um, so, you know, again, <laughs> I'll just... I guess I have to just continue the story. Right. Oswald and Thornley were only stationed together for a brief portion of their service, after which they probably never saw each other again. Or did um, they? Yep. Or did they? Well, a lot of people are going to ask that question, Mark. <laughs> Kerry gets sent to Manila next, where he sees such heartbreaking poverty that he becomes a Marxist-Leninist. Uh, he starts reading books on Marxist political theory, and he becomes more committed than ever to his pranks. The ultimate example of this is a fake Marine that he creates under the name Omar Kayyem <laughs> Ravenhurst. Um, and he does this by inserting fake records into the administrative files. He gets so far into this that he gets the military to issue a locker and a bunk to this fake soldier, and then after he leaves there's a big base inspection and all the inspectors can't find this guy who has a bunk and who has uh, like a locker and who is supposed to be turning out for inspection and it causes like a big problem <laughs> that he is, he's made a fake man <laughs> 
<laughs> um, he's a he's a very fun character in this part of his life. And After their time in the Marines. Good. <laughs> oh, yeah. After their time in the Marines, Oswald defects to the Soviet Union from 1959 to 1962. So some amount of the jokes that Oswald was making yeah. about communism were not jokes. <laughs> He's like sitting around learning um, Russian, being like, hey guys, yeah. I'm going to defect to the Russians. And everyone's like, ah! Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, oh, Lee Harvey! Yeah. <laughs> I'm going I'm to make a, I'm going to make a sitcom about Lee Harvey Oswald called Oh, Lee Harvey. <laughs> Just a, just about all his many pranks, um, like that one he carried out in Dallas. And anyway, um, so Carrie is like, wow, it's weird that this guy who I was a friend with left the Marines in order to defect to the Soviet Union. That's kind of a neat story. I'm going to write a book about it. So he decides he starts work on a fictional book based around a character that is a thinly veiled Lee Harvey Oswald. Um, this book is out today. You can read this this book that is a fictional story he wrote about his real friend, Lee Harvey Oswald. Um, and while he was starting this project, his work on his first novel, he comes across a copy of another book that's going to change his life. And unfortunately, it's Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged. Um, <laughs> he is so blown away by Miss Rand's prose that he converts from Marxism to laissez-faire capitalism overnight and basically <laughs> becomes an objectivist. Now, the thing you might be starting to get from Kerry right now is that he's a little bit of a seeker ideologically. He is very prone to encountering a book and feeling that book on a almost spiritual level and changing his life as a result of that book. Um, this will be a pattern for him throughout his life. Um, now, while he's doing this, he still has the same creative urges and he maintains his friendship with Greg Hill and he moves back home with his parents, uh, briefly at least. And during that period of time, he and Greg Hill launch a project that is an attempt at creating a humor mag magazine, which I mostly mention because of its title, Apocalypse, a trade journal for doom profits, um, which is a great title. I would, nobody I really, <laughs> yeah. Nobody, I haven't found a copy of this. I would love to. I don't even know if it exists anymore. This is proto-zine culture, um, which, by the way, these are going to be two of the guys generally credited with inventing the concept of zines. Um, and, uh, yeah, they uh, this, this particular magazine does not work very well. Um, so, you know, they, uh, they, they, they give up that project pretty early on. Life Back and Witty are graded on them both, particularly the fact that the police would keep pulling them over for wandering around at night with no clear purpose, which was <laughs> legal back then. There were actually laws about, like, being out at night without a, a reason to be out at night. Um, so they decided to move to a place where there were no laws about staying up all night and being weirdos. And that place was New Orleans. And, uh, yeah, I think that's a good point to lead into an ad break. Is it an ad for New Orleans? I hope it's an ad for New Orleans. Uh, go to New Orleans. It's a city where you can eat a shitload of alligator meat. And I assume other things. Beignets. Beignets, exactly. You could stuff a beignet with gator. You, I mm, mean, you would. Gator. I'll put gator in anything. I love gator. And I like New Orleans. Ah, we're back. We're back from New Orleans. Um, so they moved to New Orleans in 1961, and Carrie continues work on his novel, which he has decided to name The Idle Warriors. After Oswald got back from the Soviet Union, he wound up moving to New Orleans, too. Uh, he and Thornley are living just blocks away from each other, and Thornley would claim for the rest of his life that he was unaware of this, that they never saw each other again. Huh. And it's worth noting that according to Carrie's friend Becky Glazer, Carrie spent his time in New Orleans, quote, getting high off of everything. So it's not odd that he would have been unaware. There are stories that he gets high smoking banana peels, which do not get you high. Um, but... Carrie, Carrie claims he, like he makes blunts out of banana peels and claims to get wasted off of them. Uh, there's going this to be some stuff later in the story that makes this make sense. <laughs> this is more what I uh, think of New Orleans about is instead of gator yeah. meat is getting high off of everything. So, yeah, well, that is again. So Carrie's going to claim I didn't see Oswald. Mm -hmm. There's a decent chance of that purely because like he is spending most of his time getting wasted and hanging out with like 
weirdos on kind of the fringes of society. Um, And this is what's going to wind up bringing him into contact with a number of people who later become central parts in some of the early JFK assassination conspiracy theories, people besides Oswald. One of these guys is a friend of Carrie's named Slim Brooks. Now, Slim may have been a navigational consultant on the Bay of Pigs invasion. Um, We don't actually know who this guy is. There's a couple of people that we know Carrie is hanging out with who give him names that we know are fake names because no one ever existed under those names, which is part of like what leads to these guys being part of the JFK conspiracy. Also, this is a man Uh, who's known to make up people. This is a man who's known to make up people, although other people recall these folks. Okay, Um, okay. And this is an unpleasant part of Carrie's history because Slim introduces him to a guy named Gary Kirstein. And some conspiracy theorists of the Kennedy assassination think that Gary Kirstein was actually Watergate burglar and CIA spy master E. Howard Hunt um, because Gary Kirstein was not a real person. Um, now, to Carrie, the man who identified himself as Gary Kirstein, claimed to have unclear ties to intelligence agencies while he regularly spouted neo-Nazi propaganda. Carrie later wrote, quote, One of the first things I learned about Gary was that he also hated Kennedy, but for somewhat different political reasons than mine. <laughs> 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 oh, now, what, what, a, what, what a funny bit. <laughs> it, is, it is a funny bit. Um, the bit's going to get funnier. Quote, he expressed his dislike for Jews, Poles, Gypsies, homosexuals, Russians, Mexicans, and so on with a chuckle, usually, which left me with room to assume he wasn't really very serious about it. That, of course, was the assumption I preferred to make, since I really liked Slim a lot and Gary was his friend. Now, this is where we're starting to see some of the moral downsides of being as open-minded a dude as Kerry was, because he's kind of willing to be like, well, this guy likes talking a lot about Nazi stuff, but maybe he's joking. Um, uh, <laughs> I like his yeah. friend, so I'm not going to cause a problem, which is a bad thing to do. Yeah. And Gary makes another bad decision after this point, which is he decide he, he it kind of becomes a common thing for him when he's hanging out at bars with these guys to joke about murdering President John Fitzgerald Kennedy. <laughs> now, <laughs> this this may have been recorded, um, and it happens often enough that numerous people have experiences of Kerry talking about killing JFK. He puts up posters calling for JFK to be, like, arrested or otherwise taken out of the presidency. Cool, which Oswald um, might have seen. <laughs> it's not impossible. Um, although, uh, yeah, uh, this is what always What does he have against framed. JFK at this point? We're, we're, we're going to talk about okay. that, Margaret. So there's a couple of things he has against JFK. One of them is that JFK supported the side who was fighting against the side backed by Rhodesia in the Congo. Um It is unclear why he was angry at... He talks a lot about something called the Katanga Massacre, which during the Katanga War, which is this war that happens in the Congo, there were massacres on both sides. I don't know specifically what he was talking about there. He also, he's, again, he's an objectivist at this point. So he Mm -hmm. hates Kennedy's economic policies, right? Um, Uh, But he also hates Kennedy for trying to invade Cuba. Like, Kennedy's all over the map. There's so many steps with Rhodesia that I lost the the negative of the negative of the negative. Tell me where where did JFK sit on Rhodesia and where did well JF, JFK under him the United States backed a side in a civil war in Congo yeah. that was opposed to the side that was backed by Rhodesia and I don't know Kerry never said anything so pro Kerry, Rhodesia okay Kerry was angry that there were massacres in this war which he blamed on Kennedy. He was okay. also angry at Kennedy for the Bay of Pigs and for attacking Cuba. So it's it's all over the place. Op- There's this yeah. mix of like huh. right wing and left wing things that are like, again, yeah. he's all over the map um, kind of on this stuff. But whatever reasons he had for hating Kennedy, he and uh, his new buddies, Slim and Gary the Nazi, have a lot of theoretical discussions about killing JFK. (laughs) Kerry's contributions to the conversation include advocating the use of a poison dart that would, quote, blow his stomach apart, as well as another scenario involving a remote control plane carrying a bomb, which is at least innovative. And pressure. Yeah, yeah, gotta gotta give Kerry credit for predicting drone warfare yeah (laughs) um 
After Kerry finished with his mock assassination plots, Kirstein added, and next we'll get Martin Luther King. Now, this is the point at which Kerry started to wonder if maybe he hadn't fallen in with a bad group of people. <laughs> but again, he has terrible judgment and he just kind of lets this slide. Another example of his terrible judgment comes when Gary Kirstein pays him to help research a book with the title, strap in for this one, folks, Hitler was a good guy. Now... <laughs> <laughs> the premise of this book uh-huh. what, is that tell, tell, please please enlighten me on oh it's, it's a little different than what you're expecting okay. the premise of this book is that all of the other nazis in the third reich were worse than hitler so it's good that he was the nazi who wound up in charge now Ooh, this is an uh. insane thing to write a book about <laughs> this is this is full stop idiotic <laughs> and Kerry does not get involved in this Kerry is like well this guy's a weird Nazi but he's willing to pay me and I am broke and kind of willing to do anything for money like I don't mind writing out he's writing research for this thing right so basically what his research for this is he's going through the library and he's reading books on guys like Goebbels and then he's writing out things that Goebbels said that sound worse than things that Hitler said like that's that's his research on this project. Um, so, yeah, it's all it's it, good for good good for you, Carrie. Um, now, while this is going on, he is a pretty prominent member of the New Orleans fringe community. And it, this is again we we've talked about we we did in our episodes on Gabriel D'Annunzio, who's the guy. He's this Italian poet who's generally considered to be the ideological founder of fascism. He's the guy who inspired Mussolini. He takes over this city on the coast of a uh, in between kind of uh, it's in Croatia now, but it's it's near Italy, and it's after World War One. The city fume is in this kind of awkward position where it's an independent city, but it wants to be part of Italy, and he just goes and he takes it over, and. Denunzio's like a proto-fascist, and a lot of the guys who back him in this are proto-fascists, but also a lot of them are anarchists, yeah. and there are like anarcho-syndicalists involved in the government of Fume, and even some Marxists. And part of what's happening here is that, it, and this happens periodically, I think you could look at the internet as sort of a digital Fume, in like the, the late 90s, early 2000s. And we're in another, New Orleans in this period is another similar situation, where you've got all of the these kind of fringe people, many of whom are going to be very influential in the 1960s, are going to be big parts of like the hippies and all this stuff that happens, are like hanging out with like weirdo objectivists and Satanists and occult people and Nazis. And they're all hanging out in a lot of the same spaces because none of them fit anywhere else. Yeah. And, and that's kind of what happens to, in periods of time and places this is like a, this is a, a pattern that repeats itself which i'm not saying to justify on a moral level no, like no, you should no. never sit down and talk to or work with or take money from a nazi for a job like this that's an immoral act full stop i'm saying that like this pattern of you having all of these different radicals coming at stuff from different views this happens repeatedly in history like the it, punk it, scene it just like that, the punk scene yeah. right then in yeah. the punk scene there's a lot of work putting into making sure nazis can't Mm-hmm. Hold space there, right? But it took this a moment before why, I kicked in. Exactly. This is, yeah. this is why in radical spaces you have to be so diligent and um, proactive about. You know, we'll, we'll summarize it as punching Nazis because uh, otherwise shit like this happens, yeah. right? <laughs> um, but that culture didn't really exist at this point in that part in that area, or at least Thornley was not a part of it. Now, he's also hanging out with, it's not just these two weirdos, he's hanging out with a lot of uh, musicians, a lot of, like, members of the local, like, there's this kind of unique little Satanist sect in New Orleans at the time, and he's friends with a lot of those guys. He's just kind of generally in the counterculture. Um, Now, he is also, again, very... uh, 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 vociferously an opponent of JFK. Mm-hmm. Um, and largely this comes down to, I think, economics, because by this point, Kerry considered himself a capitalist revolutionary. Um, and so he had wished death on the president on numerous occasions for the president not sticking to kind of Randian principles of laissez-faire capitalism. <laughs> I, I've met so, people like this in the goth scene. Yeah. You know, Yeah. He, this is not a totally unique journey. Yeah. Um, in November of 1963, John F. Kennedy was assassinated. Kerry was working at a restaurant at the time, and when it came out that the police had arrested a former Marine, he immediately and publicly said, I bet it was my friend Lee Harvey Oswald. 
Now, his co-workers <laughs> think this is peculiar. And here's an opsec, t- opsec t- uh, tip for you kids out here. If you, if you believe your friend has assassinated the president, maybe keep that one to yourself. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> yeah, you might not want to be talking about that well, to the other guys at the kitchen. It, if there's one thing that Thornley cannot do, it is shut the fuck up. <laughs> he is like, he, he, physically incapable of yeah. shutting his mouth. Absolutely not. So it's a funny prank. <laughs> it is. It is a funny prank. Like the French Revolution, the JFK assassination is a moment so horrific and inconceivable that it spawned conspiracy theories immediately. Yeah. Carrie's co-workers suspected that he was connected to it since he looked like Oswald. This is another factor in it. He kind of lo- resembles Lee Harvey Oswald. There's talk that they might secretly be brothers. Um, this the, These are the beginning stirrings of, the, of, of what's going to become a surprisingly influential conspiracy. Um, for his part... Carrie believes that Oswald is innocent. He thinks that he was a patsy for the real killers. And he, he, I think this is just because he was legitimately friends with the guy and he just didn't really think that he could do it. Um, and in fact, when Oswald gets killed, he falls into a deep depression because he's like, now no one's ever going to find out the truth. The state has successfully murdered my friend in order to hide the fact that he was innocent of this terrible crime. Um, so... <laughs> That's where Carrie is immediately after the Kennedy assassination. And obviously, when the president is murdered, the Secret Service and the FBI, you know, get get out there, start to look into people, start knocking on doors. Um, and as they begin their investigations, they center them around these radical political communities that Oswald had also spent time around. Oswald had been living in the same part of New Orleans. So one of the areas in which the Secret Service and the FBI are looking around is New Orleans. And they start running into a lot of people who are like, you know, there's this weird guy who spent like a solid year talking about killing JFK and putting up posters. <laughs> and he kind of looked like Lee Harvey Oswald. And then they're like, oh, yeah. And also he talked about how he and Oswald were friends. <laughs> so the feds become interested in Kerry and Kerry becomes convinced that he's being tailed by the feds. Now, what if he created he be Lee Harvey of- Oswald? Like what if um, a homunculus? <laughs> That's yeah, why he yeah, looks he's an like egregore. Him. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, <laughs> doppelganger. Yeah, he, he made his own. Uh, he 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 made his own tulpa. To, that is yeah. to carry honest, the assassination that is of JFK. Not as far from what he winds up believing as I wish was the case. Um, <laughs> oh no! <laughs> so, but here's the thing. Again, you cannot emphasize how different kind of this the left is in this period of time mm-hmm. and how differently people talk but for one thing what we know now today about like COINTEL pro and the infiltration of radical communities by the fbi there are rumors about it then but we don't like have all of the papers that we do now yeah um, this is like what like this, this is like 63 yeah 63 right so Carrie, when he finds out, when he decide, when he realizes the feds are tailing him and he hears they've been looking around, he just goes to the FBI and he's like, hey, guys, I hear you're interested in me and the Kennedy killing. You want to give me a lie detector test? Th- Thornley makes a lot of bad choices throughout his life. I mean, this well, plus the, lawyer yeah. might not be the worst call. It, 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 this actually doesn't because like the FBI immediately is like, oh, this guy's kind of a kook, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, he also, he does have like an airtight alibi for the assassination. And he, Carrie frames it to them as, I want to help you track down the real killer because he wants to avenge Lee Harvey Oswald, which the FBI is probably also why the FBI is like, okay, this guy's a little bit of a kook. Carrie would later recall that the main question the FBI asked him was whether or not Oswald had been, quote unquote, a homo. Amazing. Oh my god. I love it. <laughs> good good work, guys. Okay, was he? Uh I know he was married. I don't think so. Okay. No, I, I don't think no. so. I, mean, Margaret, okay. I don't think so. Um that he that would be would be a proud moment yeah. for the community. <laughs> In LGBTQ history. Because man, yeah. again, those are not easy shots to make. No. <laughs> Sophie, Credit you seems like do. you're really excited about this line of uh I'm just really excited to see the Reddit after this. <laughs> yeah. Oh no! It's, it's just going to be people arguing that they could have hit that shot easy with a man liquor Carcano. Um, it's hard, folks. It's hard. Look, 
Uh, not a great rifle. That's why he had to, anyway, whatever. Um, so, yeah, Carrie, for the next year or so, um, Carrie, like, conspiracies start to swirl around this guy. Like, the, the, the conspiracy culture in the U.S. gets ignited again by the Kennedy assassination in a way it really hadn't been before. And Carrie is kind of the first guy people suspect of being involved when Kennedy conspiracy theories take off the ground. Yeah. Um, and that is going to have a lot of negative long-term consequences for Carrie and also everyone else in the world. But <laughs> the fast, fascinating, like butterfly effect that is yeah. still continuing on today. <sighs> but yeah, uh, let's uh, let's 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 talk about that next time. And let's talk about y'all's motherfucking pluggables this time. Well, if you want a copy of me that is armed with what was the right full? No way. I shouldn't do that. Uh, if you want a book I wrote. I wrote a book called Escape from Insel Island, and you can read it in afternoon, and it has people in it who are escaping from Insel Island. And if you want to hear us play a role-playing game based on it, we did a live play that you can hear on the podcast Strangers in a Tangled Wilderness. It'll be one of the most recent episodes, because, well, I mean, at the time this releases is. Otherwise, you might have to search for it. Um, and I have a podcast. I have a podcast called Cool People Who Did Cool Stuff. We probably won't be covering this exact subject. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, well, now, yeah, you know, Margaret, this is interesting. I actually did escape from an incel island mm -hmm. once. Um, I think I think you people in the East Coast call it Ro 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 Rhode Island. Yeah, Rhode yeah, Island. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, yes. Very similar to your story, my experience. Yeah. On Rhode Island. Yeah, it's just made of r roads, also not an mm -hmm. eye. R roads and incels. Yeah. In the 90s, when I did like weird website zine stuff, I definitely wrote weird things about being like, why is Rhode Island lying to you about everything? And it's not. I think it's a, it's a great, it's a great place to target uh, for, for like cruel jokes because like four people live there. So yeah. what are they going to do? Yeah, organize against us. Well, and it, it's because I was involved. Actually, the culture that I was involved in in the 90s was like IRC Discordian stuff. So I was hanging out with like older goths who were all part of this shit. So. Yeah, anyway. of the shit we're about to talk about next well, episode. Yeah. Garrison. If my plugs are if you want to contribute to. Uh, 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 well, it's it's not it's not quite Discordian, but if, if, if you want to feel if you want to feel like you're contributing to the work of of people in in very secretive groups who are doing who are doing uh, important work. You can donate to the Atlanta Solidarity Fund. Um, <laughs> that is the main thing I'm going to plug, along with my 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 four part series on Stop Cop City that was just released on It Could Happen Here. And uh, yeah, let's uh, you know support people in Atlanta. Um, where this story ends, by the way, uh, we are really? we are we are building to the city of Atlanta, Garrison. I, d I so. didn't. I okay, and that's I because of the name Atlantis, which actually that's the right. city of Atlanta that, that is came of up Atlantis. from underneath the ocean. Um, I, I I have been I have been screaming about this for years into my CB radio, Margaret. Very yeah. excited to talk with you all about this. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway. Go, go to go to hell, all of you. Go to hell. I love you. Go with Christ. To hell. Behind the Bastards is a production of Cool Zone Media. For more from Cool Zone Media, visit our website, coolzonemedia.com. Or check us out on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.